Um, I'm Dr Sue Keneally, I'm a GP and nutritionist with a special interest in weight management and I would just love to talk to you about the importance of a plant-based diet in the management of weight because that's what I spend a lot of my time thinking about. So for the record, I'm on the advisory board of Plant-Based Health Professionals UK that set up this event. Um, you don't need to know most of the rest of that. Um, in terms of paid roles, I'm paid to be a GP, I'm paid to tutor in the University of South Wales, the rest of that I do for love or to pass the time, um, and I have no conflict of interest. So on the menu today, we're going to look at the global increase in obesity and why that's a problem, because it is a problem. Uh, we're going to look at plant-based diets and how they relate to weight. Then I'll have a look at why plant-based diets can actually help you to manage your weight and lose weight if you need to. And there are other problems related to being overweight that are not necessarily related to losing weight, um, but are related to conditions associated with the overweight. And we can look at how plant-based diets can help with those, even if they don't help you to lose weight initially. So epidemiology, and the same word from a, another talk, um, that's just looking at public health. That's looking at populations and how they eat and how they live. So according to the World Health Organization in 2016, there are 2 billion adults worldwide who are overweight. 2 billion. 650 million are obese, and 39% or 40% of women of adults are overweight, and 13% of the population of the world is now obese. And in, in most countries now, the population are more likely to die of overweight than underweight which is a stark change from when I was growing up. But in 19, 1975, which isn't quite when I was born, but it's close enough, um, obesity just really wasn't a problem, and now it's our biggest public health crisis. So looking at dietary patterns associated with obesity, this is worldwide, not necessarily the UK. We're seeing in the developing world, people are gaining weight, and they're gaining weight quickly. And it's because they're eating more animal fat and more animal protein. And it's because they're eating more refined grains and added sugar. Yes, they found flour and sugar and they like it and they can afford to eat it so they're eating it and they're gaining weight because of it. In the UK it's more to do with meals outside the home. Uh, when I was growing up we rarely ate out, it was a real treat. Um, now people eat outside of the home routinely. Um, portion sizes have gone crazy since I was a child. Um, everywhere is super size and we now have inexpensive, energy dense, processed convenience meals everywhere. I rarely ate anything that wasn't home cooked when I was growing up. Um, now it's easier to buy convenience food than it is to buy fresh ingredients to cook your own food. And that has implications for our weight and our health generally. So problems associated with obesity, for those of you who may not know, and diabetes is the big one, ischemic heart disease, some cancers, not all. Um, liver disease, I won't talk about that because we have a talk on that later. Um, dementia, I don't think we knew that till recently, but that is very much associated with being overweight. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, mental health problems. Um, depression is very much linked with overweight. It can go either way. Um, you're depressed, therefore you comfort eat there, you become overweight, or the other way around. And reduced lifespan, up to 10 years if you have enough excess weight, you can take 10 years off your life very efficiently. So causes of obesity, um, this is something that's doing the rounds at the moment. Um, this is the Dunning-Kruger effect. And when I started studying obesity, I was over here like, huh? I didn't even know there was a problem. So this is how much I know, and this is how much I think I know. So you do a little bit of research and you go, okay, so it's just eat less and move more. Fine, easy. Um, then. It really isn't just eat less and move more, because if that was the case, we would all, or all of us who wanted to, would be thin. So then you go through, well, there's more to this than I thought, and then halfway through my nutrition degree, I hit panic. Um, and I can't claim to be over here, because there are world obesity experts who spend their entire life just researching that, and I'm more of a generalist. So I'm, I'm not here, but I know people who are, so I'm sort of over here, it's starting to make sense. What I do know is it's complicated. So if you want to know what causes obesity, here comes the slide. That hasn't come out very well. Um, those dots are basically a spaghetti map. It basically looks like a, a, if you see it properly, it looks like a plate of spaghetti bolognese. 
there are more than 100 causes and they're all very complicatedly interlinked with each other um, and it's very difficult to tease it all out. There's social, cultural, financial, um, appetite related things, genetic things, it's, it's everything. It's everything to do with our lifestyle causes obesity. So what is the, the basic problem? Well, essentially, it's what we were talking about in the last lecture. It's about pleasure. So this is your pleasure center here. This is the back of your brain. And it's a little M25 of neurons. And um, things that give you pleasure can feed in here at various different junctions. So whether it's salt, fat, sugar, gambling, sport, anything you can be addicted to, hard drugs, they all feed in there somewhere. I was reading yesterday that saturated fat behaves very much like cocaine in terms of what it does to this brain. And essentially what we're looking at is our deepest neurological wiring <coughs> means that when we're looking to how we spend our time, we are essentially, as human beings, seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, and conserving energy. So we want to be pain-free, sitting down most of the time, and enjoying ourselves. So um, getting out and working out really hard, or going to get food that is difficult to prepare, or eating food that we don't really enjoy just isn't natural to us. Um, and that's what we're fighting against. When people put lovely food in the supermarket that's full of fat and sugar and salt, we want it because we're seeking pleasure. It also acts as a very effective drug. Um, if you're depressed or you're in pain and you eat comfort food, it makes you feel great. And it's not a placebo effect. It genuinely does make you feel great. So it's helping you to avoid your pain. And then if you're conserving energy as well, um, that's a double whammy. So let's have a look at plant-based diets and weight. Um, the Seventh-day Adventists, they're a great group of people. Um, mainly, the studies are mainly done in California, in America. And the reason that we like to study them as a group of nutritionists is that they live a very similar lifestyle. The problem with studying nutrition is everybody lives such a different lifestyle. So if you see an effect, you can say, well, it could be because of the diet, but it could be because this person did more exercise, or maybe they got more sleep, or maybe they're a different social class or maybe they're less stressed, and it's very difficult to say that this change that we're observing is because of the, the diet. Now, Seventh-day Adventists, as a group, tend to lead a fairly similar lifestyle. Um, they all have great social co connections, um, they all have very similar religious beliefs, they believe in healthy diet, but they have a lot of different opinions about what healthy diet means. Um, they all do a similar amount of physical activity, and they have the same kind of attitudes to mindfulness and that kind of thing. So the main thing that varies among this group is the diet that they eat. They mainly eat healthily, but some of them believe they should be omnivore, some of them believe they should be vegan, some are vegetarian. So it's interesting to study them because you can make some conclusions. I think probably living in California in the sunshine helps. But meanwhile, if you look at Seventh-day Adventists, uh, the omnivores, as, on average, they're very nearly obese, BMI of 29.6. Um, and the only group that were in the healthy range were the vegans of 23.6. Now, I know you might criticize body mass index because there are problems with it, but as a, a basic population guide, the vegans weighed less. Uh, so plant-based diets and weight, let's have a look at the actual weight loss. So there are nutrients that we can eat that increase or decrease our weight. Um, then we can have a look at energy density. I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. And then we'll have to look at processed foods. At plant-based health professionals, we tend to advocate a whole food plant-based diet. Um, remember what Alan was saying earlier about a vegan diet versus a plant-based diet. Um, we try to advocate mainly eating plant-based rather than vegan junk food. So we'll have a look at the junk food as well because that's one of our big problems that's up and coming. So foods associated with weight change. The foods most associated with in increased energy intake and therefore increased body weight are sugar, salt, and processed fats. Uh, and they're found mainly in processed foods. You don't find them in naturally occurring plant foods. Um, if you saw me mention the bliss point earlier. The bliss point is something that food manufacturers have identified, and they know that if they put refined sugar, salt, and fat into a product, we will go crazy for it because it does stuff to our pleasure center and we'll want more of it we'll find it addictive. So say, for example, I was to pass um, 
a, a dish of, well, let's say it's a plant-based meeting, so I usually say butter when I'm talking to the general public, but um, vegetable-based spread and said, help yourself, pop your finger in or take a teaspoon and eat however much you want. Probably most of you wouldn't be that interested. Or if I said, here's a bowl of refined sugar, pass it round, help yourself. You might dip your finger in, have a little taste. What if I passed a bowl of cake mix round? Oh yeah, yeah, because that's sugar and salt and fat combined. That's yummy. Um, so can you think of any, this is a trick question, naturally occurring foods which have significant quantities of both fat and carbohydrate in them? Yeah. Durian. Durian fruit. What's that? Durian. Uh, durian. Asian durian fruit, uh, which are uh, high in fat and for this <laughs> taste okay. And uh, everyone likes it, and there is even the monuments in Asia which uh, highlight this fruit because it's so tasty that it's yeah. almost addictive. Now then, I've seen um, raw food plant people to eat a lot of durian, don't they? Yes. They love it because it has lots of calories in it. That's the first time anybody's come up with one. <laughs> so there's one. Um, the other one is milk, which, as we learned from Ellen, we really shouldn't be consuming beyond weaning. Uh, we're the only species that consumes milk in any form beyond weaning. So, yeah, milk, because we're supposed to go crazy for it as infants, that's what keeps us coming back to the, the breast or the formula. It's really addictive stuff. Um, but in naturally occurring food, apart from durian, which I'm now going to put into my talks in future, um, um, there aren't any, and that's for good reason. Okay, so foods most associated with decreased energy intake and therefore healthy body weight are protein, fibre and water. And this is water in foods. It's not necessarily have, having a glass of water with your food, although that does help. It's um, your soups, your um, fibrous vegetables like celery, those kinds of things that have high water contents in them. Um, Protein, obviously, you get that in plant and animal foods. Fibre and water you find only in plants. Okay? You won't find much water in your steak unless the butcher's injected lots into it to make it look bigger than it is, but naturally occurring, there isn't any. And a word on fibre, it's not found in animal-based products. Um, this is a slide that I've used in a couple of talks. This is when I was talking about health. So um, if you eat a high-fibre diet, you get a lower risk of heart disease and some forms of cancer. But have people heard of Dennis Burkitt? He was a physician from the last century, he described Burkitt's lymphoma and some other things. He did lots of research in Africa and India and worked in the UK as well, so he studied both populations. And he concluded, if you eat unrefined foods, you produce large stools and build small hospitals. If you eat a processed diet, you eat fibre-depleted foods and you produce small stools and build large hospitals. So important to do vegan poos, ladies and gentlemen. You can actually sell vegan poo, actually, if you live close to Harvard. Um, it's so good for fecal transplants and things that they'll actually buy it from you. Uh, right, let's look at energy density. Energy density is the number of calories per pound or per mouthful of foods. So over here are some plant-based um, <coughs> examples. So looking at the green and yellow at the top, um, so leafy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, fruits, whole grains and legumes. If you eat all of those, so um, up to 172 kilocalories per 100 grams or less, and eat only those, you may be a little bit bored, um, but you will probably lose weight. Um, that's because as human beings, we tend to eat the same weight of food per day. We tend to eat, most people eat between four or five pounds of food in weight per day. So if you're eating four or five pounds of this kind of thing, you're going to be eating about 1,500, 1,600 calories, and maybe less, depending on your um, relative quantities of each. Um, if you're eating nuts and seeds, they are great. I eat nuts and seeds every day, but at 700 calories per 100 grams, and multiply that by, was it by 15, 16 to get to four or five pounds, that's an awful lot of calories, and then the spreads, and the baked goods, you start to see why if you're eating four, four pounds of biscuits a day, you're gonna put on a lot of weight. So for the record, the energy density of meat um, is about the meat substitutes, which I do sometimes eat myself. Um, and then cheese is around the same as biscuits and cakes down here. So that would be one reason why it's a little bit more difficult to lose weight on an omnivore diet. Of course you can, there are plenty of commercially available um, 
diets out there that, that are omnivore, and of course there's the low carb, high fat, which you can do a vegan version, um, but typically includes meat and dairy, and you can lose weight very easily on those things. But actually, on a, a, a whole food, unprocessed diet, um, if you're sticking to mainly these, um, it can be really, really healthy, really tasty, and you can feel full all the time and lose weight fairly effectively. So let's have a think about processed foods. Um, so processed foods have a higher caloric availability. Do we know, know about caloric availability? So if I, say, make myself three or 400 calories worth of salad, okay, lots of leaves and legumes and things that are quite difficult to digest, um, as I start to eat them and my body wants to break them down into their individual nutrients and absorb them so that it can actually use them, um, that takes calories and it takes actually quite a lot of calories um, for me to break down all the different um, cell membranes and um, all the different component parts. So if I'm eating 400 calories worth of salad, I'm probably only absorbing maybe 320, 350 worth of actual calories because I've used so many calories to absorb it in the first place. If I eat three or 400 calories of processed food, that goes straight in. That takes no work at all. Your body can just absorb it as it is because it's so refined, your body has very little to do. So if you eat 400 calories of processed food, you're probably getting almost 400 calories of food into your body. Um, so it's, um, that's a, a net gain. Um, another problem with processed foods, they're typically less satiating. They, they don't fill you up as much. Um, if you eat whole, whole foods, Again, it may not be as exciting, but after a big plate of whole foods, you will be full and you'll probably be full for a long time. If you eat takeaway, um, the classic one is Chinese. You know, the, the cliche about if you have a Chinese takeaway, you're hungry again in 30 minutes. Um, that's because a lot of it is um, processed carbohydrates. I've got no objection with a healthy home-cooked Chinese diet. I think they could teach us a lot. But in terms of the takeaways that we buy, um, they're not satiating, satiating at all. They fill you up for a few minutes and then you want a, another meal. Um, and they tend to have a higher glycemic index. Do we know about glycemic index? Yeah, lots of nods around the room where if you eat something um, that's refined carbohydrate or sugary, it makes your blood sugar shoot straight up. And then because your body doesn't like having lots of sugar around, it'll do whatever it needs to do to get your blood sugar to come down again. So it probably crashes down too far. And so then you get hungry again, so you eat something... Um, probably low glycemic index again because nobody's ever craved broccoli so then it goes shooting back up and so um, then your body goes into crisis and says well I need to get the sugar back down so it goes back down and you end up on a cycle whereas if you eat a low glycemic index diet where your blood sugar just goes up and down slightly then um, you will have less of the crashes and you will not crave the junk food um, incidentally do you know how much in terms of weight um, how much sugar we have in our bloodstream on average um, not immediately after a meal, because that's very variable, but say a couple of hours after we've eaten, just before coffee break now, how much in weight of sugar do we have in our blood that's freely available? It's one teaspoon in our whole body. Because our body knows that we need to get it out of our bloodstream. We need to either use it or store it, otherwise it's toxic. Um, okay, so processed foods are also addictive. I was talking about this point earlier, I think I've covered that. Um, Schultz and colleagues, um, they basically fed lots of students lots of different foods and asked them to talk about withdrawal symptoms. And the most addictive food that they found, um, surprisingly, was pizza. I think it didn't help that they were surveying students who live on pizza. But yeah, cheese is the most addictive food, and particularly in the context of pizza, because that's a combination of the fat, the refined carbs, and the, the salt. Um, and processed foods are also associated with approximately double the risk of obesity. This was a study done in Brazil, so maybe not quite applicable to the UK, but I think the physiology is the same. They looked at processed foods in the diet and um, just talked to Brazilians about what they ate. And yeah, the, they realised that the Brazilians who ate the most processed food were twice as likely to be obese as those who ate the least. Does it work? So there's lots of good reasons why you might be less overweight if you eat a plant-based diet, because hopefully you're eating an unprocessed one, so you're eating foods that are filling and not addictive, um, and you're eating a generally healthy diet, so you don't go craving junk food. Does it work? I found one trial, so 
Um, this was a randomized controlled trial, a low-fat fat plant-based diet with an, comparing with an omnivore diet, and these were overweight people. This is important because if you study weight in people who are healthy weight, they tend not to lose weight, so you don't see many results. But these were overweight. Um, and this was Carly Over et al. Um, but Neil Bernard was the... It, it was his lab who were doing the investigating, and if you don't know, Neil Bernard is a fairly big plant-based doctor in America, has done an awful lot of research. So it was his group, but Calliova was the publisher. And um, after 16 weeks on a low-fat vegan diet, um, they lost 6.5 kilos. Now, I can only begin to dream of my patients losing 6.5 kilos in 16 weeks. That would transform my working life. I would love that. Um, I, I don't think I've ever lost 6.5 kilos in 16 weeks myself, even when, when losing baby weight. And when I did need to lose 6.5 kilos, but, sorry. Ask me, I'll help. Thank you. Um, I think I've got the hang of it now. But, um, but uh, yeah, um, I've, I've never done that in 16 weeks. So um, also, um, I love this. There's a big debate in the media about the moment, at the moment, especially among doctors, about low carb, high fat versus um, a high food plant-based diet, which is essentially usually a high carbohydrate diet, although you can do a low carb version of it. Um, and in this study, um, the higher the carbohydrate intake, the better your weight loss and the more improved your insulin resistance was, which is a big problem for diabetes. So this would suggest to us that a high carb diet, if done properly, is absolutely fine for diabetes. And so one of my low carb, high fat colleagues talked to me about well, you can't have carbohydrates because if diabetics have carbohydrate metabolism problems, then they shouldn't have carbohydrate. Um, this is a trial you can put back to them to say, well, actually, yes, you can. You just have to be careful how you do it. It's not about eating Haribos. It's about eating fruits and vegetables. That's where we've gone wrong. Instead of eating sugar in fruits and vegetables, we've started putting it in cakes and biscuits. Because if you think about it, sugar is in all the healthiest foods that we should eat. There's a reason why we're we have a circuit that makes us go absolutely crazy for sugar. It's be because before we started inventing cakes and biscuits and cola bottles and all the sorts of things that my kids love to eat, um, it was only found in fruits and vegetables. We are supposed to physiologically go absolutely mental for fruit. Okay, so meta-analysis. Um, there are a couple out there. This was a good one that um, I came across. This was 12 trials, over 1,000 subjects, eating either a vegetarian or a vegan diet. Heterogeneous trials. I think I've probably said that in every essay I've ever written. Oh, the trials were heterogeneous, which means they were different. Um, so it might have been just for a few weeks. One of the trials might have been, I think, 48 weeks was the longest. It were a couple for six months. So it's very difficult to make generalizations from so many different trials, but you can try. Um, and there were significant weight loss in both vegetarian and vegan diets. Um, with or without energy restriction, which, by which they meant sometimes they said to people, well, just to eat a vegetarian diet or just eat a vegan diet. And in some trials they said, well, eat a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet and we want you to reduce the amount of calories that you eat. So not surprisingly, the, the ones who were told to reduce the amount of food that they ate lost the most weight. Um, but overall, the vegans lost more weight. Now, sadly, only 2.5 kilos. That's probably not quite the 5% body weight loss we're looking for that were associated with the most health gains. That's probably 2 or 3% for, for most people. But hey, I'll take it. You know, looking at my patients, they really struggle to lose any weight at all. Most of them gain weight steadily rather than lose it. Um, OK, so looking at the non-weight loss benefits in obesity. Obesity is a multi-system disease. It's associated with lots of negative effects, not just because you're overweight. And a plant-based diet can improve some of these in obese people, whether or not the plant-based diet is causing weight loss. So we'll have a, a brief look at inflammation. Um, we'll look at epigenetics. That's one of my current favorite things to read about. Uh, we'll have a look at your microbiome and your telomeres. So obesity and inflammation. Obesity is essentially characterized by a low-grade pro-inflammatory state. Um, I realized studying, even before I started studying nutrition in depth, um, that when I was talking to people about how to, my patients about how to live better, whether it was to reduce your risk of heart disease or to reduce your risk of further heart disease or reduce your risk of cancer or blood pressure or so many other things, I was 
always saying the same thing. I was saying you need to eat a healthier diet, you need to exercise more, you need to get enough sleep, you need to manage your stress efficiently. And I was giving the same advice no matter what the situation was. And essentially it's because most of Western diseases are caused by the same thing, which is just inflammation in your body at a long-term, low-grade level. Not so much that you particularly notice it, although some people do with aches and pains and that kind of thing, but for most people, it's something that they're unaware of that's just going on in the background that's causing disease, and it's very much associated with obesity. Um, and plant-based diets have been shown to reduce markers of inflammation in those people. So. Um, Eichelman et al, they had a look at um, interventions in oh, investigating the effect of plant-based diets. Inflammatory markers are just things we talk about as, as doctors and research scientists. I'm, I'm not a research scientist, but um, I've read a lot of their work. So CRP is something that we measure as medical doctors. So that's something that we look for if you have arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease, that sort of thing. But if your CRP is just slightly raised, it can be a marker of low-grade inflammation that causes all these problems I've been talking about. And then more in a lab-based setting, your IL-6, your interleukin-6, um, is a marker of inflammation as well. We don't concentrate that very much in the clinical world, but it's interesting for research. And if you put people on plant-based diets, they will generally reduce their CRP and their interleukin-6. There wasn't much evidence for all the other inflammatory markers that we talk about, but those two in particular were reduced. <coughs> Okay, epigenetics. I love this. Epigenetics is the study of changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. So it's the idea that you have genes, but they're not necessarily fully expressed. So say, for example, um, I probably have genes that increase my risk of high blood pressure because both of my parents and everybody else who's a generation older than me in my family has high blood pressure. And we generally live a healthy lifestyle, so it's likely that hypertension is genetic in my family. Um, at the moment, I'm riding the crest of the wave. I have not hit the point where I have hypertension. Um, and that's beyond the point where several of my relatives got to. By the time they got to my age, a lot of my relatives were taking medication for hypertension. So I have the genes, almost certainly, but for some reason, I'm not fully expressing those genes yet. Um, I haven't become hypertensive. And it's the same with lots of other things. So, um, so a gene can be present in our DNA, but not necessarily fully expressed in our phenotype, our physical appearance and our physical structure. Um, a number of things can affect it, and that can be for good or bad. You can, you can really mess with the genes if you want to. And this can vary throughout life, so you can change things. You can switch genes on and off um, by changing your diet and your activity levels and your stress and so on. Um, and there's also something that I really need to read more about, which is transgenerational epigenetics. And the idea of that is that it's possible that my own personal risk of having high blood pressure right now is affected by the way that my great grandmother chose to live. And so I was born with particular genes switched on or switched off or partially switched on because of the way she lived, and it was passed down to me through my grandmother and my mother. To me. We haven't found any evidence that it goes back more than four generations, but we can certainly go back four generations and identify things that people did then that affect how we live now. But because it's epigenetics, I can still change that by the way that I choose to live today, and I can pass that on to my children, and hopefully my great grandchildren will live slightly more healthily because of the choices that I made when I was having my children. And if I had a month off, I would choose to just sit down and read about transgenerational epigenetics because I think it's one of the next big things. And it seems that plant-based diets are favourable. There are only a couple of examples that I found that are relatively concrete. Um, so obesity is a condition affected by numerous genes, and many of them are susceptible, susceptible to epigenetic manipulation. Um, so looking at sugar-sweetened beverages, and sugar-sweetened beverages are quite strongly associated with obesity. <laughs> One of the problems with liquid sugar and your body doesn't recognise it very well. So if you eat 200 calories of sugar for breakfast, solid sugar, say jelly beans, because you're a healthy kid, so you have jelly beans for breakfast, why wouldn't you? Um, your body will say, oh, you've just had 200 calories of sugar. I'm going to send a message to the brain so that the brain will adapt and make sure that when you're having your 2,000 calories today, or whatever it is you normally eat, um, will account for the fact that you've had 200 calories, and will make sure that you only have 1,800 for the rest of the day because your body likes to regulate itself that way. It's very good at it, as long as you don't feed it junk food. Um, if you drink liquid sugar for breakfast, 
body doesn't even notice it. It goes straight through and you'll just have the 2,000 calories as well, probably. So sugar sweetened beverages are a big problem for obesity. And um, the Chinese guys studied um, the strength of the expression of obesity-related genes and obesity risk in people consuming different amounts of sugar sweetened beverages. And what they found is that the more sugar sweetened beverages you drank, the more you expressed your obesity-related genes, and it was that way around. It was not that the obesity genes were making you drink more sugar. The more you drank, um, the more you were likely to switch on the genes that made you gain more weight. And the same is true of fat consumption, and this is my fact for this lecture that I didn't know that I've learned. Um, so that at Corella et al. in 2011 studied carbohydrate and fat consumption to look for epigenetics related to obesity. And they didn't find much for carbohydrate, but they found that the higher fat intake that you have, the more you're likely to modify your obesity genes in favour of gaining more weight. And they found it was particularly strong, and this is what I love, in saturated fat. And saturated fat is largely only found in animals. Okay? So if you stick to vegetable-based fats in your diet, naturally occurring was not the nasty vegetable ones, but naturally occurring fats, nuts, seeds, avocados, durian, um, um, then um, you should be fine. Whereas if you're eating saturated animal fats, um, they will switch on your obesity genes and make you tend to get more weight. Okay. And so the microbiome, um, this might be something that grosses you out a bit, but you see me standing in front of you, you see um, a female human being, so you assume that most of my cells are human being female cells, actually the majority of me and you is bacterial. And we have numerically we have more bacterial cells in our bodies than we actually have human cells, which is fairly gross, isn't it? Um, but we need to take them seriously, you know, if there's more of them than there are of us in each of our bodies, then we need to think about them. So obesity is associated with the inflammation. And your microbiome, your gut bugs, play a significant part in this, and they change very and rapidly in response to the diet changes, is probably from when we were hunter gatherers, and so one day we'd live on nuts and seeds and fruit because that's all we could find, and then um, somebody would manage to kill a big animal, so then we'd eat meat for a while, and our gut bugs are very good at shifting back and forth, presumably to deal with that from um, our ancestors. So there are lots of good gut bugs around. Some are associated with pro-inflammatory states, those are your thermocutes, don't worry about the names. Um, and then there are some that are anti-inflammatory and those are your bacteroides. People with obesity, surprise, surprise, they tend to have more of the thermocutes. In plant-based diets, um, you'll have fewer thermocutes. Now we don't know how much of an association this is, but it's still a good thing. Um, and also, this is less of a, a concern for obesity, it's more to do with heart disease. People heard about TMAO in the media, it's, there's a big thing about um, vegan diets and TMAO at the moment. Um, TMAO is a substance that's strongly linked with heart disease. If you have vegan gut bugs, um, it's very difficult for you to make TMAO because it's the other gut bugs that do it, so you're also lowering your risk of heart disease. Um, and changing to a plant-based diet, can alter the microbiome to that. So just because you were born with an omnivore microbiome, you can change it very quickly if you change your plant-based diet. So you can have less inflammation. And this is my last general point. <coughs> telomeres, when I was in medical school, nobody mentioned telomeres. Okay. Um, telomeres are the little caps on the end of your chromosomes. Uh, hang on. Let's go to that. Right. Those there, those little caps at the end of your chromosomes, um, they're very protective. They protect you against disease, they protect you against aging, and they get small age type cell replicates in telomere, they get ever so slightly smaller, and a fast shrinking in telomere means faster aging. There's some evidence, it's not huge, but there's some evidence that people with obesity have shorter telomeres. That's not a surprise because it fits with everything else. Um, there was one trial of a lifestyle intervention, as we see Nornish famously published the reversing heart disease study that was published decades ago now. Um, and he showed um, with Elizabeth Blackburn who did the original work on telomeres and got the Nobel Prize for it. And they worked on this together and they showed that if you live a healthy lifestyle, including a plant-based diet, not just a plant-based diet, um, then you'll have longer telomeres at five years of follow-up compared with 
people that they didn't do anything, they just watched their team, team and they just watched them. <coughs> it was a small study, the data were very limited. Um, P is 0.03 for non-statisticians non in the room. That just means it's likely to be significant, but not massively so. But it's an effect. It's, it's adding to the overall picture of obesity and why plant based diets will help. So that's essentially my talk, but a couple of terms of points. A word about patients with obesity for those of you who have patients. Um, there are more than 100 causes of obesity, and most of them are beyond the control of most people. It's social, it's cultural, it's economic, it's political. It's things that your average person living in average UK life can't control very well. Yes, they can eat less and they can move more, but there's a huge industry battling against them to make them buy more and move less. Um, so it really is battling against our most basic instincts um, if we're going to try and lose weight. So don't blame them. If it was easy, easier to eat less and move more, most of us would be thin, except for those who want it to be avoided for some reason. The most encouraging thing I ever tell my patients is how hard I have to work myself to keep my own weight healthy. Um, they come and see me and say, well, what do you know, doctor, because you're naturally thin and you've got pots of money and um, I can't afford to buy all the expensive food that you buy and I can't afford the expensive, expensive gym membership that you pay for. Um, well, I'm not naturally thin. I have genes from the top end of the Welsh Valleys, which are the most obese genes in the UK, probably. <laughs> Yay. Um, and um, I don't eat an expensive diet. I eat a vegan diet, which is cheap. When my omnivore family are eating steak, I'm eating lentils. It's cheap. Um, and it, yes, I pay gym membership because I like it, but there's no reason why I couldn't just get a decent pair of walking shoes and just go walking for half an hour a day. That would do the same job, probably. Um, so actually when I sit down and say, no, I feel your pain because I have to work really hard too, patients really appreciate it. So as we said before, they'll include it. It's complicated. Super kind to them, okay? The struggle is real and you, you know, we as health professionals may not have that struggle, we'll have other struggles. But for them the struggle is real, so don't blame them, love them. It's essentially it. So people who eat a plant-based diet are the only group who have an average BMI in the healthy range in the developed world. Um, there are a number of reasons for this, including the fibre, the water, and until now, little processed food, although I share Ellen's concern that uh, there's now a massive vegan junk food industry, and I fear we're going to lose this bragging right very soon. Um, but for people who are overweight, the plant-based diet is effective in promoting weight loss and also reversing metabolic diseases associated with overweight and obesity, whether or not they lose weight, which can only be a good thing because the NHS is in crisis. <coughs> Thank you.